This is all true, right? This is why we have such a problem with bully, cheating, lying, hack, partisan prosecutors, because they are some of the most powerful people in the whole country. And apparently they can do whatever the hell they want in Fulton County because of this immense power to strike at citizens, not with mere individual strength, but with the force of the government itself within the DOJ to pay for all necessary expenses of investigations and prosecutions by independent counsel, which again, doesn't exist anymore, or other law. So that's their power. Judge Cannon, are you kidding? Jack. Smith is up against the ropes. The clock is ticking. Now he has to justify his entire existence. Why is he even here when he was illegally appointed as the special counsel? Why illegal? Well, because the president never appointed him in the first place and the Senate never confirmed him. And we have this little pesky thing in America, or we thought we did, called the U.S. Constitution that says by the statute, by the language in the document that they have to follow appropriations and appointments mechanisms in order to get him in a position like this. And they did not follow that. Trump submitted this one. We know Southern District of Florida, Judge Eileen Cannon presiding, West Palm Beach Division, United States of America versus Donald Trump. This is Trump's supplemental submission. So we've already read through the prior filings. And if you miss those, they're excellent. Many from Ed Meese. If you search on our channel, you'll find them. But here is the supplemental because Cannon said, all right, we're going to have a hearing on this. No problem. Come out here and bring everybody to come argue this thing. But I need some more information. So send me some more stuff. And here it is. They say, all right, good morning, Your Honor. So this is President Trump. And we're here respectfully submitting this supplemental brief because you asked us to. You wanted some more information about this case called CFPP versus Community Financial Services, and so we'll clarify this for you, Judge, right now. They say this Supreme Court case called CFPB further supports Trump and Trump's motion to dismiss. In fact, it supports the fact that Jack Smith is illegal. First, under that case, they say that the DOJ's permanent indefinite appropriation is not available to fund Jack Smith's case. They call it an election interference mission because the designated purpose of the appropriation, which is the money, the appropriation does not encompass Jack Smith's politically motivated work. We're not paying for that. And second, although that case rejected the association respondent separation of powers arguments under the appropriations clause, saying that maybe Congress has the power and the executive branch doesn't, the Supreme Court's analysis of that issue does not apply in the context of a motion brought by a criminal defendant with important constitutional rights that must be protected. So this case doesn't sound like a criminal case at all. It sounds like CFBP versus Community Financial Services. So that's not a state or a prosecutor versus a defendant. It sounds like civil litigation. So they're saying, well, why are we even talking about this? This is a criminal defendant with constitutional rights, so it's not exactly the same. And third, Trump also agrees, Judge Cannon, with your honor's suggestion that the threshold issues in Trump's motions based on the appointments and appropriations clauses are purely legal questions. We agree. However, the argument by Jack's office that the DOJ could have have drawn on other appropriations. So Jack Smith says, well, maybe we shouldn't have been using that money, but we could have drawn on other appropriations to fund Smith's office would require the court to make fact findings supported by evidence from the DOJ or the special counsel if it's necessary to reach that issue. So saying, yeah, we don't think you need to like dig into this. You don't need to go and find out where the money came from and all these things. Like we don't need an evidentiary hearing with witnesses and evidence. We think you can just look at the law. It's clear. This is how Jack Smith came into power. This is the documents that they sign and the power they claim. Here's what the law says. It's just a legal fact, legal question. But if you need to go in and we need to dig into where this money, okay, yeah, we might need to do that as well. But saying, all right, Cannon, so let me just give you some more background, Judge, if you want. In this case, the Supreme Court held that the appropriations clause, which is where the money comes from, they said the way this rule works is it requires, quote, a law that authorized expenditures from a specified source in italics. So it, you have where to come from with some specificity and the money needs to be designated for designated purposes with some clarity. Not Jack Smith can have an unlimited credit card for whatever he wants. Under that analysis, the question is whether the text of the pertinent law contains the requisite features of a congressional appropriations. Now, for the purpose of this case, in Trump's case, the pertinent statutory text is the permanent indefinite appropriation, right? So there is no specificity that the DOJ is using to fund this sprawling politically motivated lawfare by Jack's office. They tell us, provided further that the fund Funds appropriated to the DOJ in this act not exceed a million dollars may be transferred to this appropriation to pay the expenses of independent counsel, which is different from special, no longer valid, upon notification of the AG on appropriations of the House of Representatives and provided further that a permanent indefinite appropriation is established. Okay, this is where the money's coming from. A permanent indefinite appropriation is established like a limitless credit card with no limits within the DOJ to pay for all necessary expenses of investigations and prosecutions 
by independent counsel, which again, doesn't exist anymore, or other law. So that's their power. Judge Cannon, are you kidding? The rules say, the Supreme Court says, it has to be specified. They wrote that in this case, and it needs to be for a designated purpose, just if you're missing it on the screen, just to be ultra clear. But the special counsel says, no, it's indefinite appropriation for whatever investigations and prosecutions that the independent counsel or other law allow us to do. Huh. So it sounds like that is not in comportment with the Supreme Court, which we just double circled. Sounds like Jack's illegal. So because there are no more independent counsel appointed because that act lapsed because it was a terrible act, Trump's motion requires analysis of the two phrases. What does other law mean? And what does lowercase independent counsel mean? They say, all right, Cannon. Now for the reasons set forth in Trump's motion to dismiss based on Jack's illegal appointment, the DOJ's quote, permanent indefinite appropriation is not available to Jack because he was not lawfully appointed pursuant to this other law. He doesn't have access to those funds. The appropriation specifies the objects for which the DOJ can use those funds. Now, Smith's election interference mission is not one of them. And so thus, Smith's appointment does not satisfy the first textual requirement for accessing the money. He doesn't have access. Now, the fact that Smith is not an independent counsel under the permanent indefinite appropriation serves as a second alternative basis to grant Trump's motion. In this regard, Jack's office is seeking to have it both ways. They're emphasizing the attorney general's control over Smith. So they say, whoa, 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 no, no. The attorney general does have some power over Jack Smith and therefore it is a valid appointment and survives Trump's appointment clause challenge, but also eliding those authorities to support a flawed independence argument for the appropriations clause. Now, specifically under the appointments clause, Jack argues that Smith is subject to the direction and the supervision by a presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed officer. Okay, so maybe Jack Smith, his argument is, okay, well, so what if I wasn't appointed by Joe and confirmed by the Senate? Who cares? My boss is. Merrick Garland was. So eat it. I'm subject to his supervision. But they also say he's independent, so Merrick Garland is not really orchestrating anything. Now, the office summarized their control as follows. They said the attorney general supervises the special counsel's work. Oh, that's interesting. So he's not independent at all, is he? May remove him from the office, may review and countermand his decisions. And as an additional means of exercising control, Merrick Garland can rescind the regulation at any time or amend the appointment order or exercise direct statutory supervision over Jack Smith. So it sounds like Jack Smith's kind of like an employee of Merrick Garland. So he's not independent at all. Interesting. Another opposition brief, they then quoted the final rule from the Reno regulations, which is where they think they have their power regarding the balance between independence and accountability, right? Some independence. Now the final rule confirms that the Reno regulations eschewed what the office describes as a significant statutory freedom under the DOJ supervision. Now the Independent Counsel Act has lapsed. Under the Reno regulations, they're explicitly cited in the order appointing Smith, their various U.S. code provisions, saying the ultimate responsibility for the matter and how it's handled will be with Merrick Garland. And so they acknowledge in there the possibility of a review of Jack's work. So put simply, the office has touted Jack's lack of independence in response to the appointments clause challenge. So they say it's not an illegal appointment because he's just an employee of Merrick Garland. So he doesn't need to be appointed. But for the purpose of the other challenge, so now we say he works for Merrick. Okay, well, what about the money that Jack Smith is spending, which is tens of millions of dollars? Then suddenly the Jack office says, oh, we're independent. That's why we can access the money. And it ignores the importance of the attorney general's ultimate responsibility for Jack. Now, instead, the office goes to Black's Law Dictionary and says that independent counsel are simply attorneys who provide an unbiased opinion or conduct an impartial investigation. So they say Jack is an independent counsel. So he counts. So that's why he can access the independent counsel money, even though there are no independent counsels anymore. In an ideal world, those are hardly distinctive features for any attorney, okay? Acting on behalf of the U.S. government. So don't act like it's like, wow, wow, you're a U.S. attorney. You're acting in an unbiased way. Wow, shocking. You all should. Prior to Smith's appointment and his politically motivated lawfare, most people would have expected all DOJ attorneys and independent counsel alike to behave in that fashion, not like corrupt partisan hacks. Thus, if the office is correct and the expectation of an unbiased and impartial behavior is all that the term independent counsel, like that's it, you just gotta be like a good dude, then you're good, that's all it requires, then the DOJ's permanent indefinite appropriation lacks the designated purpose. So you can't have it both ways. Like the money needs to be for something. And if the money is only for like good bro, honest dudes at the DOJ, yeah, man, then that's not good enough. Like what's it for? Indeed, under the office's argument, the limiting phrase in the permanent indefinite appropriation, the credit card without a limit on it, would be devoid of any content. Okay, independent 
independent would just mean an ethical guy as required by the state bar. You can't even have a license if you're a piece of crap, which is a statutory instruction that is to be avoided under well-settled law. Now, contrary to Jack Smith's manipulations, okay, the term independent in the DOJ's limitless credit card should be interpreted in accordance with its plain meaning, which is entirely inconsistent with the attorney general and their oversight as mandated by Reno. Independent should mean independent, not mean work for Eric Garland. The GAO's analysis of Patrick Fitzgerald's funding made that clear, so this is a different case. They said they looked for indicia of independence. Were you actually working for them? In contrast to Smith, when we had this other counsel, special counsel called Fitzgerald, he operated under express exclusion from the Reno regulations, and he did not need to follow department practices or procedures. He was outside. And because Smith was not appointed under the other law, he's not independent. And the DOJ's funding of this permanent limitless credit card violates the Constitution. And finally, Judge Cannon, the separation of powers also does no violence to Trump's reliance on that doctrine. In the Supreme Court case, the court focused on the fact that the appropriations clause presupposes Congress's power over the purse. And the respondent associations offer no defensible argument that the appropriations clause requires more than a law that authorizes the disbursement of the funds. Now here, Trump's argument is that the DOJ expressly promised Congress that after the lapse of the Independent Counsel Act, attorneys acting as lowercase independent counsel would be part of the department's budget. Now as set forth in our brief, Congress chose not to renew or to reinvent independent counsel. And so there is no more money for that. There, the DOJ itself created a separation of powers problem by failing to make good on its assurance at the hearing. And so, Your Honor, if you think that we need further investigation, we'll consider it. It may be warranted. Now, we agree that these should not, though, require factual development. These are just legal questions. And Your Honor, you're a judge. You don't need to go find new facts. Under either clause, both of these items require a dismissal of this entire case because Jack is not the right prosecutor and he shouldn't have had any money for this. However, in response to Trump's motion based on the appropriations clause, Jack Smith has said that they could have drawn on other appropriations. So we could have gotten money over there or money over here. Now, contrary to their claim, we very much dispute that point. They can't get their money from anywhere else. We've done our research. The court should reject these series of attenuated sites and authorities because they rely upon a failed effort to suggest that Trump has not been injured by this Biden campaign surrogate lawfare trying to harm Trump. It is unlikely at best that there was any source of funding at the DOJ that could have funded this sprawling, politically motivated activity that Jack Smith has undertaken because Biden handed him a blank check. As we've already noted, Judge Cannon, and as with any government agency, the realities of bureaucratic resource limitations have constrained the DOJ's work in the past. Money stops them from going hog wild. And therefore, to the extent the court reaches this issue, the DOJ and the office should be required to substantiate their position. If they say that they can get money from elsewhere, they should prove it. Where would that money come from? And schedule an evidentiary hearing. Signed by Todd Blanche, Christopher Keese, Trump's defense attorneys out in Florida. And they're not alone. The team that really brought a lot of this to the light and to the attention of the public are our friends Ed Meese and their team. And this gets filed by Edward Trent out at Cher and Jaffe, counsel for the Amici Curie, who are Ed Meese and others. And so here is the supplemental filing from the former Attorney General of the United States, who also makes the point that Jack Smith is illegal and unconstitutional and his money was illegally converted from us to him. This is the supplemental brief. Former Attorney General Ed Meese and Michael Mukasey and law professors Calabresi Lawson. We also have Citizens United as Amiki Curie supporting Donald Trump's motion to dismiss the classified documents case. All right, Judge Cannon, great to be in your courtroom yet again. This is the team, Meese and Co. We're submitting this supplemental brief because you asked us to. Now, Jack Smith's argument to this court is pretty flawed. Why? Well, it fails to address the fundamental problems that we've already identified here. First, Your Honor, it is clear that the position that Jack Smith holds was designed during a time when the executive branch gave little to no thought to the appointments clause. But that's their problem. Even so, nearly all the special prosecutors appointed during the past 40 years, aside from Smith and Mueller, all of them have been lawfully appointed pursuant to the clause because they were already serving as Senate confirmed U.S. attorneys. Already serving. So if you are going to be a U.S. attorney, you've got to be appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. We're having a bunch of debates over this right now. 
when the Senate saying, we're going to refuse any of your U.S. attorney nominees moving forward until you stop this political lawfare. So good news. But guess what? Mueller was not. But Mueller at least had been a U.S. attorney before. And at some point, at one point, had been appointed and confirmed by the Senate. But Jack Smith has not. Second, notwithstanding Smith's arguments, his entire office is not properly established by law, as that phrase was understood during the founding era. And third, this case reconfirms Justice Jackson's reasoning on the importance of Senate confirmations and why you need this and why the special counsel in this made up position poses far too much of a danger to escape the accountability protected by the proper application of the appointments clause in the first place. All of this reaffirms that Jack Smith and his appointment is unconstitutional. Canon, your honor, history shows that Jack Smith type appointments generally do not suffer from the same constitutional infirmity as Jack Smith's. We've done this before. Contrary to Smith and his attempt to portray the authority of his appointment as being supported by long-standing precedent. Jack's like, we've done this all the time. You guys are making a big deal out of nothing. In fact, the legal basis for his appointment is a vestigial holdover of a bygone jurisprudential era. It's antiquated, Your Honor, and not relevant today. And that legal flaw likely went unaddressed. So they're saying, well, we've been doing this for so long and no one's made a problem of this. It went unaddressed because, with only one exception, each special prosecutor for more than 40 years before Smith's appointment was in fact duly authorized by the statute. So nobody complained about these rules because everyone was actually following the rules that should have been in place. The pertinent history begins in 1974 when, without examining the requirements imposed by the Appointments Clause, the U.S. Supreme Court in U.S. versus Nixon briefly mentioned that the Attorney General had appointed a special prosecutor in that case. The court did not indicate the disapproval of that method of appointment. So back when Nixon was around, they just appointed a special pro. How do we do it? Here's one. And then there was a Supreme Court case, but nobody brought up that appointment in that case. The question presented in the Nixon case didn't even include that. Nobody questioned it. Nor did a single statement in that decision suggest any contemplation of the pertinent constitutional requirements imposed by that clause. So they're relying on Nixon. Well, they're saying, well, the Supreme Court reviewed a case kind of like this where there was another person, and but they never even brought it up. Nobody challenged it. It was not until two years later that the Supreme Court inaugurated the modern era of the Appointments Clause analysis in this case called Buckley versus Valio. It was a pure curium opinion, so we don't have a, an official person right. It's the opinion of the court, so it's nobody's taking ownership of the opinion. And the court has continued to develop that area of law most recently in 2018 and again in 2020. So suffice it to say that today, the Supreme Court takes the Appointments Clause far more seriously than it did in 1974. Nobody cared about it back then, but the courts do now. They're talking about it every two years so often. So from 1978, Judge Cannon, through 1999, moreover, special prosecutors were called independent counsels, and they existed because they were appointed under a statutory provision to an office that the Supreme Court upheld as an inferior office in a 1988 case. But that statute, okay, the independent counsel statute, which is not the basis for Smith's appointment, is gone. No longer exists. And Morrison is therefore not controlling here. So you can't take this deleted case, essentially, and use that as precedent. So from 1999 until present, with only one exception, which is Robert Mueller, every special prosecutor now called special counsel who was appointed under the Reno regulations was a U.S. attorney. And as such, was a Senate-confirmed presidential appointee who held office pursuant to the statute that creates the position of the U.S. attorney. So we have the Constitution, which says you can create other positions in this way. That's the Appointments Clause. And then the Congress passed other statutes. We have the position of U.S. attorney and rules for appointing that person. So all of those appointments were perfectly legal because the special counsel, the designation, merely added an item to the portfolio of the principal officer whose appointment conformed to the requirements of the Constitution. Now, accordingly, after Nixon and until this case and the Mueller case, there was never any occasion to consider the constitutional implications of vesting such enormous power in someone whose position was never created by an act of Congress. This new person, Jack Smith, comes out of thin air, never received their appointment by action of the President of the United States or consent of the Senate. From 1937, more research, until 1976, the Supreme Court invalidated few statutes and executive actions on separation of powers grounds. Now, in short, the idea of a chief prosecutor not authorized by a clear statutory provision or with approval of the Senate is a dinosaur. It should be declared extinct. Like, where's the power come from? Now, Smith 
Smith cannot deny that. In 1791, the phrase established by law in the appointments clause meant you had to have a congressional statute. So you can't just cobble together regulations. Remember, it's constitution, the supreme, then we have US code, then we have regulations. They're using the regulations to say Jack can exist. No, it's gotta be in statute because that's what the constitution says. The proper application of the appointments clause, Smith's brief does not even attempt to rebut this, that we say it shall be established by law. That clause refers to a statute. And for good reason, no fewer than 14 provisions in the original constitution use the word law in this fashion. Smith doesn't even try to address this. Now, moreover, an examination of the framers' history confirms that the power to create federal officer positions is specifically situated in the Necessary and Proper Clause, U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18. And the powers provided by that clause are properly exercised only when Congress passes legislation that is then signed by the president. You can't have an attorney general named Janet Reno who just cobbles together stuff. Accordingly, it cannot be seriously debated that, under the Constitution's original meaning, that Congress has the exclusive constitutional power to create federal offices. Only they can, not Jack Smith. Now, as one of many examples, when this person called Elbridge Jerry suggested way back in the day, in 1787, we're going back in the time machine, there was a constitutional convention, Elbridge Jerry, he said, we should add a necessary and proper clause. We should add the phrase that no officer shall be appointed but to offices created by the Constitution or by law. The addition was narrowly defeated only because it was unnecessary, right? So that didn't make it in there. But Buckley finally gave effect to the critical separation of powers rule that the only branch that can create an office is Congress, is the only branch that cannot fill that office. So Congress creates the positions, the executive fills them. Every officer appointed in the executive branch that does not arise directly from the Constitution then must be the product at least of two of the three branches working in concert. We separate power. Congress creates the office, executive branch fills them. What has happened here, the executive branch created the special counsel's office and then they filled them. Now acting pursuant to its office creating power, Congress has created many offices within the DOJ. Congress has, and they did it by statute. You see this US code right here. So it's constitution, the Supreme, then we delegate that from the constitution. We then get the US code and Congress writes the US code. So they've got US code. Code 503, created the Attorney General, got it. 504, Deputy AG, Associate AG, which is who Matthew Colangelo was, Solicitor General, Assistant Attorney Generals, and U.S. Attorneys. Those are the offices, various heads of the DOJ components. And for a time, Congress authorized an officer called an independent counsel, but that does not exist anymore. But the only officer creating statutory provision authorizing the Attorney General to appoint an officer is a provision that governs the Bureau of Prisons. So this is part of the Reno regulation. Regulations. They say, well, we can't appoint some people. Like, we can appoint some people because the Bureau of Prisons can't. Saying the Attorney General may appoint officers and employees as he deems necessary for the BOP. But the provision covers the BOP only, the Bureau of Prisons. It doesn't cover the DOJ. So you can't extract from that and say that it's yours. Now, Smith doesn't dispute that, but instead he claims the power for his appointment lies in other provisions. Okay. But as Amiki and Trump's counsel have already explained, we read previously, none of those provides the kind of general officer creating authority for the DOJ, and none of the provisions that Jack cites provides the kind of general officer creating authority that Congress has given to other department heads. Other departments can create other things. But Amiki have already referred to those. No such statute gives the DOJ, beyond its Bureau of Prisons component, the power to do this. But if Smith's argument were correct, then this statute would violate the canon against surplusage, because Smith's statutory authorities would give the AG plenary, total unlimited power office creating power anywhere within the DOJ. So if he can use that to do this, then he can do anything, including the authority to create officers without even following the statute. And that power would extend beyond the entire DOJ. That would be an enormous elephant crammed into a tiny little mouse hole. Now, Jack's broader argument also suffers from the same flaws as he submitted originally. His dearth of evidence regarding the original meaning, alongside his failure to reconcile his centuries-old citations and legislative history is a total fail. Instead, his brief goes on at length <laughs> about what some congressional staffers thought in the early 1900s when they wrote reports. They never even voted on those things. And none of those things were ever signed by any president at all. And he's going back to a bygone era when federal prosecutors had a fraction of the power they now possess. And he now seeks judicial support 
in a Second Circuit case from 1975, okay? A year before the Supreme Court came out with their landmark Buckley decision, which rewrote all of the Appropriations Clause jurisprudence. So those non-binding authorities should not even be considered to overcome the extensive evidence that the Appointments Clause original public meaning says Jack Smith lacks the authority to do what he's doing. He does not have the type of prosecutorial power wielded by Smith because he did not appropriately attain it. And so Judge Cannon, former AG Meese says, this case also reaffirms Justice Jackson and his insights on why such vast prosecutorial power requires both a duly enacted statute and Senate confirmation. We have this for a reason. The conclusion finds support by from this fellow, Attorney General Robert Jackson. 80 years ago, this is what he said. He was out there speaking. He was talking to the nation's federal district attorneys, which was the previous name for the U.S. attorneys. And here's what he said. It would probably be within the range of that exaggeration permitted in Washington to say that assembled in this room is one of the most powerful peacetime forces known to our country. The prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. His discretion is tremendous. He can have citizens investigated, and if he is that kind of person, he can have this done to the tune of public statements and veiled or unveiled intimations. Or the prosecutor may choose a more subtle course and simply have a citizen's friends interviewed. Now, when he was exploring the specific powers, Justice Jackson continued, future Justice Jackson, so he was the AG of the U.S. Attorney. He ultimately became a Supreme Court judge. Then he said, as the justice, he said the prosecutor can order arrests, present cases to the grand jury in secret session, and on the basis of his one-sided presentation of the facts, can cause the citizen to be indicted and held for trial. He may dismiss the case before trial, in which case the defense never has a chance to be heard. Or he may go on with a public trial. If he obtains a conviction, the prosecutor can still make recommendations as to the sentence, as to whether the prisoner should get probation or suspended sentence, and after he is put away, as to whether he is fit subject for parole. And he continued, concluding by explaining why anyone exercising this enormous federal power requires presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. And by the way, this is all true, right? This is why we have such a problem with bully, cheating, lying, hack partisan prosecutors, because they are some of the most powerful people in the whole country. And apparently they can do whatever the hell they want in Fulton County and other places. And they're using it to go after their political opponents. So the judge said this, now because of this immense power to strike at citizens, not with mere individual strength, but with the force of the government itself, the post of the attorney general from the very beginning has been safeguarded by presidential appointment, requiring confirmation of the Senate of the United States. You are thus required to win an expression of confidence in your character by both the legislative and the executive branches of the government before assuming the responsibilities of a federal prosecutor. We got to make sure you're legit and we need two branches of government before we give you the power of the whole government to go wreck someone's life. Jack Smith never had that at all. For all the reasons that Justice Jackson articulated with respect to U.S. attorneys, Jack Smith exercises the power of a principal officer as they do and as such requires both the personal nomination of the president, the executive, and the majority of the Senate. Smith has neither, but that's not all. Under Smith's claim of statutory power under 515 and 533 and perhaps other provisions, if he has this right, the attorney general could create an entire shadow government within the DOJ by just creating offices out of thin air. For every position established by Congress, the attorney general could invoke his power to create a new officer who would report exclusively to him, and he could implant that new officer alongside or perhaps even with supervisory authority over each officer that Congress authorized. The obvious answer to such a dystopian and frightening version that he can just create offices and appoint people in this top law enforcement agency, Congress created something entirely different. They created an agency that answers to the American people, that answers to their elected lawmakers and to their elected president. That's the face of democratic accountability, but Smith's argument claims that Jack Smith has unchecked unilateral power to do whatever he wants. Now, as we have noted, Your Honor, Judge Cannon, one shudders to think what abuses might have been condoned in the McCarthy era if attorneys general had unlimited and unchecked power to create inferior officer special counsels. And it's precisely to avoid these terrible abuses of power that U.S. attorneys have always, throughout all 230 years of American history, required nomination by the president and confirmation by the Senate. Now, recent history shows that people with Smith's title or the independent counsel predecessor could pursue a former senior agent 
agency official, White House officers, a president's son, and lower ranking persons as well. But by pursuing a former president of the United States who's the current leading candidate to be the next president, Smith's prosecution here shows that how he wields his power to profoundly alter the trajectory of a presidential election, he's doing it with the destiny of the nation. He is thus one of the most powerful officials in the entire U.S. government. The idea that he can exercise that enormous power without a Senate confirmation is intolerable. And even worse, the idea that he can do so without holding an office that was created by Congress is unthinkable. Your Honor, Judge Cannon, that reality is compounded by the obvious ease with which this problem could have been avoided. As suggested by Justice Jackson's observations, Attorney General Garland could have appointed a special counsel who is already a U.S. attorney, duly appointed to that office by the president with the advice and the consent of the Senate. That simple step would have avoided not only the serious constitutional problem that has now been thrust upon this court, but also any delays occasioned by the present and well-founded motion to dismiss. But why didn't he want to do that? Well, maybe because an actual real U.S. attorney would never have brought this sham case. For these reasons, and those stated in the amici's opening brief, the motion to dismiss this indictment should be granted. Please do it, Judge Cannon. Signed by Edward Trent on behalf of Ed Meese and the amici, all submitting their supplemental filings saying Jack Smith is illegal. He is unconstitutional. He was never appointed by the president. Wasn't even ever a U.S. attorney. They dragged him out over from Europe when he was there prosecuting in The Hague, and he was the person willing to accept the assignment. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, violate the United States Constitution, go after our political opponents, spend a gob of money to bog him down, and get a trial and convictions before the election. Jack Smith says, I'm your guy. So they tried to shove this down our gullet, but now we've got Ed Meese and Trump's defense raising a ruckus on this, and Judge Cannon is going to be holding a hearing on it, and we cannot wait to get our hands on those transcripts as soon as that hearing is over. We're going to be digging in on those and seeing what happened because Jack Smith has got to go. We love it when you subscribe to our channel. So thanks for doing that if you haven't already. We'd also very much appreciate a like on this video. We got some great links down in the description below. But if you enjoyed this video, you're going to love our next segment. It's coming up right next. We're going down to Georgia and we're going to see what Fannie Willis is up to because her lover, Nathan Wade, botched an interview with CNN. So we're going over there. We'll see you on that video there on the next one and back here. We'll see you soon.